Hello, in this video, I'll be showing how to solve for a stereographic projection function along with its inverse by forming ratios out of similar triangles. Let's start off with a sphere whose center is at the origin in R3, O, and which also has a radius of 1. The sphere isn't required to have its center at the origin, nor does it need to have a radius of 1, but I'm going to go with my original choice. Let's list some more given information. We're going to let n equal the point on the sphere, 0, 0, 1. It doesn't matter much where this point is on the sphere, but I'm choosing the North Pole for simplicity, hence the given name n. I'll also keep the directions of the standard positive x, y, and z axes in R3 off to the side to make things a little more clear as to where the positive coordinate directions point. Let's now draw an xy plane which slices through the equator of the sphere at height z equals 0. This plane in reality extends out to infinity, but it looks smaller in order to conserve screen space. Some people may prefer to have the plane position elsewhere such as at the bottom of the sphere such that the sphere and plane intersect each other at only the south pole. This choice would also be fine, but I'll keep the plane at the equator for this video. As another given, we're now going to let the point P equal some arbitrary point on the sphere defined by Cartesian coordinates P1, P2, and P3. For further clarity, this point is not inside of the sphere, it's just some arbitrary point on the sphere whose distance from the origin is one unit. From the distance formula in R3, this implies that the sum of the squares of P's coordinates must equal 1. Our last given is that we're going to let the point Q equal the point in the plane to find by Cartesian coordinates q1, q2, and 0. Point q is where the line that runs through n and p intersects the plane. Going backwards, you could also say that point p is where the line that runs through n and q intersects the sphere. Notice how point q has a z-coordinate of 0. This is because the point will always live in the xy plane whose z-coordinate is locked at that fixed value. Something to think about is that placing this plane so that it slices through the equator makes it so that any point P on the upper half of the sphere gets projected outwards to Q, any point P on the lower half of the sphere gets projected inwards to Q, and any point along the equator of the sphere thus gets projected to itself. However, in a case such as the one where the plane is below the sphere, any point P on the sphere is projected outwards to point Q in the plane, except for when you let P equal the south pole of the sphere, which in that case it just gets sent to itself. Alright, let's go back to our original setup with the plane at height z equals 0. Some of you may have noticed that the closer point P is to the North Pole, the further out in the plane point Q ends up being. If you then let P equal the North Pole, you would encounter an undefined output of the function that projects the sphere to the plane, due to the output coordinates equaling 0 over 0. My short summary about the North Pole is that it can either be excluded in the domain of the function so that the sphere with the North Pole removed maps to the plane, which is just R2 in this case, or it can be included in the domain and is said that the entire sphere projects to the plane, unified with what is known as the point at infinity. Don't worry if what I just mentioned doesn't make much sense. More about this point at infinity and ultimately proving that stereographic projection is a homeomorphism would be a great whole other topic for another video. All that we'll be doing next is focusing on finding the stereographic projection function along with its inverse. Alright, so here's what we're going to find. Part 1. By forming ratios out of similar triangles, show that the stereographic projection function f of p equals q, which maps the point p on the sphere to the point q in the plane, as shown in the diagram, is defined as follows. To make things a bit easier to understand, for this forward function, we simply plug in point p, and then the output is point q in terms of point p. As you can see, there is no third coordinate in the output of the function. This is because point q's third coordinate is 0, which can be excluded when writing out the function. Part 2. Using the results from part 1, also show that the inverse stereographic projection function g of q equals p, which maps the point q in the plane to the point p on the sphere, as shown in the diagram, is defined as follows. This time, we plug in an arbitrary point q from the plane into the function, and then the output is point p in terms of point q. Once again, here q only has two coordinates because its third coordinate is zero. Alright, let me clean up the screen a bit. Now, here on the right hand side is where we'll begin with the solutions. I've broken up part one of this exercise into three easy steps. Remember that to project the point P, our goal is to find Q in terms of P. I'm going to let step 1 be to perform orthogonal projections of our diagram onto only the coordinate planes which contain point N. Some people may refer to orthogonal projections as orthographic projections. The two names go hand in hand. Alright, we're in R3, so there are three coordinate planes. These are the XY, XZ, and YZ planes. 
our point n is held in the z-axis of our diagram, so we must orthogonally project our diagram onto the xz and yz planes because they are the ones that contain the z-axis, which ultimately holds the point n. Just as a fun little side note, it turns out that for r to the n, there are n times n minus 1 over 2 coordinate planes in that space. For example, in r4, we know that there are 6 coordinate planes. If we added another axis, call it the w axis, these planes would be the wx, wy, xy, wz, xz, and yz planes. If we were to stereographically project the hypersphere from r4 down to r3, while still holding the point n in the z axis at the north pole, we would only need to consider orthogonal projections onto the wz, xz, and yz planes. This concept can then be generalized to n dimensions. Alright, let's now proceed with the orthogonal projections onto the xz and yz planes. To do this, I will first draw a little blockhead person wearing a hat, looking directly against the negative y-axis at the xz plane. Imagine what it would look like seeing out of the blockhead's eyes. It should look something like this. This is the 2D orthogonal projection of our diagram onto the xz plane. All we did was remove the y-axis from the main diagram. Alright, I've changed the position of the blockhead. It's now looking directly against the positive x-axis at the yz plane. Try to imagine what it would be like seeing through the eyes of the head. The answer should look something like this. This is the 2D orthogonal projection onto the YZ plane. All we did was remove the x-axis from the main diagram. For a better visualization, here's what everything would look like if the point P danced around the sphere at an equal height. Alright, this brings us to step 2, which will be to label the bases and heights of the right triangles formed out of the points N, P, Q, and O. I'm first going to focus in on the points to make things easier to read. On top, we know that this is P1 and that this is Q1 because they are P and Q's coordinates that are held in the x-axis. On bottom, we know that this is P2 and that this is Q2 because they are P and Q's coordinates that are held in the y-axis. We also know that both of these heights are equal to P3 because both the xz and yz planes share the same z-axis. Likewise, point n has a height of 1 in both planes. Taking the long distance minus the short distance in the z-axis gives us these remaining gaps equal equal to 1 minus p3. Doing the same for the x-axis, we get q1 minus p1, and for the y-axis, we get q2 minus p2. Both the xz and yz planes each have three main triangles that can be formed with these new labels. First, we have these bottom ones. Second, we have these outer ones. And third, we have these top ones. For each plane, all of the right triangles that I just showed in that plane were just scaled versions of the same right triangle. These are what we call similar triangles. All of these possible right triangles in the xz plane are similar among themselves. Likewise, all of these possible right triangles in the yz plane are similar among themselves. For further clarity, keep in mind that I'm not saying the right triangles in the xz plane are similar to the right triangles in the yz plane. We cannot assume that they're similar because remember, points P and Q are arbitrary points with arbitrary coordinates. What we can assume is that the triangles in the xz plane are similar among themselves and the triangles in the yz plane are similar among themselves. Alright, I'll now clear up some space. We're now at step 3 which is to form ratios among the labeled similar triangles and solve for point Q in terms of point P. So, it turns out that similar triangles have the same corresponding ratios of their bases and heights. Therefore, we're allowed to equate similar triangles base over height ratios. There are other combinations of these ratios that we could choose from and equate, but I'm going to stay consistent with base over height. Let's first start off by looking at these lower triangles in both planes. The top triangle has a base over height ratio of Q1 minus P1 all over P3, and the bottom triangle likewise has a base over height ratio of Q2 minus P2 all over P3. Let's now look at these two triangles. On top, the base over height ratio is Q1 over 1, and on the bottom, it's Q2 over 1. We're allowed to set these new ratios equal to the previous ones due to them being corresponding ratios of similar triangles. Let's finally look at these upper triangles. The top one has a base over height ratio of P1 over 1 minus P3, and on the bottom, it's P2 over 1 minus P3. We likewise set these new ratios equal to all the previous ones due to the similar triangles. Okay, let's take a closer look 
at these ratios. We really didn't need to form the first ones, but I thought I should include them for the sake of completeness. Looking at these other ratios, dividing by 1 does nothing, and we're left with q1 equals p1 over 1 minus p3, and q2 equals p2 over 1 minus p3. We also know that q3 is 0, which was a given. Since we now have all of q in terms of p, we can now write out our function f of p equals q. And this brings us to the end of part 1. I'll now put a check mark next to what we needed to find for part 1 to indicate that it's been completed. Let's now proceed to part 2, where we'll be finding the inverse stereographic projection function that maps point q to point p. I've broken up part 2 into three easy steps. Remember that our goal will be to get p in terms of q. Our first step will be to start with the final values of q from part 1 and solve for p's coordinates. Let me refresh your memory. From part 1, after forming the ratios out of the similar triangles, we got q1 equals p1 over 1 minus p3, and q2 equals p2 over 1 minus p3. After cross multiplying, we have p1 equals q1 times 1 minus p3, and p2 equals q2 times 1 minus p3. I'm also going to write that p3 equals p3 because we don't know much more about it than that. We're now at step 2, which is to plug p's coordinates into the equation of the sphere and solve for the coordinate whose expression is itself. From step 1, one, the best we could do for p3 was get it in terms of itself, thus p3 will be the coordinate that we'll solve for first in terms of q. The general equation of a sphere in R3 is x minus x naught squared plus y minus y naught squared plus z minus z naught squared equals r squared, and this is where x, y, and z represent the coordinates of any point that belongs to the sphere, x naught y naught z naught represents the center of the sphere, and r is the radius of the sphere. Luckily, we're dealing with a centered at origin unit sphere. This means that x0, y0, and z0 are 0, and the radius is 1. The equation of our sphere is therefore x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. Alright, so we know that this is the equation of our sphere, and we also know that point p belongs to this sphere. So let's plug point p into the equation of our sphere by letting x equal p1, y equal p2, and z equal p3. Therefore, p1 squared plus p2 squared plus p3 squared equals equals 1. I made things easy in this step with a centered at origin unit sphere, but you have to be careful in this step for spheres that aren't centered at the origin or don't have unit radius. Alright, so if the sum of the squares of p's coordinates equal 1, and if those coordinates equal what they do as defined above, this then means that we're allowed to do some plugging in, and we get that q1 times 1 minus p3 squared plus q2 times 1 minus p3 squared plus p3 squared equals 1. To tackle this and solve for p3, we can first distribute the squares on the left, we can then do some factorization on the left and move the p3 to the right hand side, the right hand side can then be expanded, the square on the left cancels out with 1 minus p3 on the right, we can then distribute out the left hand side, we'll now collect all terms that contain p3 to the left and then push everything else to the right, let me now clear up some space. We can then factor out negative p3 on the left and negative 1 on the right, cancelling out the negatives and dividing both sides to solve for p3. We finally get that p3 equals q1 squared plus q2 squared minus 1 all over q1 squared plus q2 squared plus 1. This brings us to step 3, which will be to plug the p-coordinate obtained from step 2 into the remaining unknown Cartesian coordinates of point p. After plugging p3 into the equation for p1, we get this expression. We can then form a common denominator out of the 1, some terms in the numerator cancel out, and then after the 1s are added together and the denominators are combined, we get that p1 equals 2q1 over q1 squared plus q2 squared plus 1. We have now obtained p1 after plugging p3 into p1's expression. If we go ahead and plug p3 into p2's expression and follow the same steps as we did for p1, we would then get that p2 equals 2q2 over q1 squared plus q2 squared plus 1. Since we have now found all of p's Cartesian coordinates in terms of point q, we can now write out our inverse stereographic projection function g of q equals p, and I'll put a little check mark next to what we needed to find in part 2 to indicate that it's been completed, and we're now towards the end of the video. Hi, thanks for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe. If there's one more thing that I want you to remember from this video, it's that we're not limited to stereographically projecting between the ordinary sphere and the ordinary plane. 
and math were also allowed to stereographically project between n-dimensional spheres and n-dimensional planes. Going down a dimension from what I taught in this video, that means we can project a circle to a line, and then going up a dimension from what I taught in this video, we can project the hypersphere of which is naturally embedded in 4D space, and we can project it down to the entirety of three-dimensional space. This stereographic projection of the hypersphere is very important to me because it serves as a viewing window into the fourth dimension and ultimately allows us to see the hypersphere's hop fibers, which are these right here, with our very own eyes. Once again, thanks for watching and more content is yet to come.